after Russia's invaded, what happens next? So that we're all on the same page for tonight, let's go through a quick recap of what we had last week. So what do you remember? Elpis Israel, the book written by Brother John Thomas with extensive exposition of the Bible, especially in regard to the hope of Israel, hence the name Elpis being hope in Greek, Elpis Israel, the hope of Israel. And many of us, and many of actually what's been covered in the past two lectures and this lecture can be found in this book. We also looked at Ezekiel 38 of the um, basis of the king of the north, um, that being Gog, Rosh, Russia coming down to Israel to take um, the land. We also saw Russia and its alliances in the time surrounding these events. And I think you had uh, this, this map up where we see Rosh with Meshach and Tubal, then Magog and Goma going to Europe, to Gama, Persia, Libya, Egypt, and Ethiopia, all part of the Russian Confederation to come against Israel for the spoil. England or Tarshish, Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, and, or, and not, not part of that, as we have seen recently with Brexit, Tarshish coming out, or the UK out of the EU, hence not being a part of the European alliance, and Sheba and Dedan are the only ones who are not part of the Confederation. Also, we have the spoil, the spoil which we had a look for, the motive of Russia coming down against Israel, and we've suggested last last week the leviathan fields found in the mediterranean just off the coast of israel these potentially could be a likely motivation for the invasion um, you can talk to anyone who knows anything about supply of oil and gas and they can tell you that russia is a pretty key part in in its department now you could probably even google this but according to sources that russia has the largest petroleum reserves and the largest export of natural gas not only that but it has the second largest coal reserves, the eighth largest oil reserves, and is one of the largest oil producers in the world. Now, that, that is basically what the world runs off. So that puts Russia in a very dominant political um, power in the world in regards to resources. And lastly, we touched briefly on the Jews' miraculous return to the land, the land of Israel, the only nation in Earth's history to after nearly 2,000 years return to the same patch of land, even though it was dispersed amongst the nations, suffered unimaginable hostility and violence. And in 1948, it was declared a nation to the shock of the most of the world. But as we know, it, this is the will of God, and it happens regardless of man's actions. So we come to our topic tonight of Russia's invasion, what happens next? But before we pick up where Andy left off last week, I just want to show you how relevant the topic is for today. You see, on sun today, Sunday the 24th of May 2020, Russia is already in the Middle East. I don't know how much you've been keeping up with the news or even remember how much of it. But I'm sure you're aware that Donald Trump, who's in, in power in the US, which you probably would know, um, he's been pushing a, an agenda of make America great again. Now, you only have to listen to that statement to know that he's not really taking much care of other countries. So hence, in roughly October to December last year, America pulled out of the Middle East, America being the dominant force in the fragile Middle East. I don't know if you even noticed this, but literally the very next day, Russia literally marched into their empty barracks left by the US. And there is a specific Russian Mediterranean task force that you can see on the left uh, hand picture on the screen that, that they've been deployed and I think they're called the death fleet or something along those lines but if you look at that map and if you take away the US warships um, which we know and have seen that they'll either get removed out of there or they won't even bother getting involved with Ezekiel 38 there's only a British submarine and a French warship left and that's not much to compensate for the force of Russia's fleet in there in their presence um, but not only um, naval, but military within the within the political world as well. So, sorry, USA, Russia. In the political world, Russia's 
been toiling away to create plans. Iran and Syria are part of the alliances um, of Gog, as we've seen in Ezekiel 38 a couple of slides ago. Saudi Arabia also is the only other major oil producer and dist distributor um, which really rivals Russia. So naturally, uh, there's the um, reason for an alliance. And again, at the moment, they're aligned with Israel, um, but we know that not to be true. Just a couple of interesting facts that Israel, it's generally accepted that about one in six people in Israel, either Russian or from Russian um, descent coming from the Soviet Union, or, um, and are also the second most spoken language in Israel is Russian behind Hebrew, showing the Russian dominance already in Israel. But as we know, both Saudi Arabia and Israel will leave the alliances with Russia, bringing the swift destruction or near destruction of Israel. And so we come to our topic tonight, Russia's invasion. From Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38, we know that Russia will come from the parts of the north, thou and many people with thee, all riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army, to quote. And you can stay in Matthew tonight, I'm just going to have the verses on the screen, but if you want to turn them up and practice turn them up if you want, that's completely fine. But if you come to Zechariah chapter 14, which is the second to last book in the Old Testament, we're given a few more details on the things concerning Russia's invasion. So Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, on the screen if you want. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, Thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. As you can see, Jerusalem in the last days will be a horrendous time and place to be in. But notice the links already we've got to Ezekiel 38 from last week. I mean, we've got the spoil, verse 1, that divided amongst the nations. Also, we have the nations gathering to Jerusalem in all the nations, the alliance with um, Gog, Russia, the same synonymous. And Jerusalem will fall. Jerusalem shall be plundered the houses for any spoils of worth. An awful time and place to be in. Half the city taken into captivity. But there will be a small few which remain in the city. And it's at this point, the point when Israel is on its knees and could no way in itself win, win the war. And if by some miraculous means they do win, then there's no way they can say it was themselves or they could attribute the win to Israel. It is then and only then that the Lord Jesus Christ will come with the saints and fight against the nations that fight against Israel. Another passage, Ezekiel 39, verse 1 to 5, adds details um, to, Ezekiel, um, to Ezekiel 38, next chapter, and it literally follows on from last week. So here we're talking, um, he's talking to Gog or Russia in the time of the invasion. And it's an interesting note that from this passage, we will see that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. And God plans and purposes what will happen. God's will will happen. And we can have so much confidence that God's will will happen. We are told in, if you're making notes, Jeremiah 31 verse 35 to 37, that if the sun and moon no longer rises and sets, if literally the earth's orbit continues discontinues from spinning, which will have traumatic consequences, then we can know that the nation of Israel will be cast off from God. God will have no more interest in them. But that's highly improbable, in fact, impossible, going to happen unless God does it. So we can have confidence that Israel will not be cast off further. So that in mind, Ezekiel 39, verse 1 to 5, says, Therefore, the son of man, Prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief of prince of Meshach and Tubal, talking to Russia, and I will turn thee back 
and leave but the sixth part of thee, so five sixths go to war, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring upon the mountains of Israel, again echoes of Ezekiel 38, and I will smite thy bow in thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall at thy right, and I shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured, thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. To, notice, to note from this, God is the one that brings Russia against Israel. God is the one that will use Russia to destroy Israel. Again, the links back to Ezekiel 38, the north parts, the countries mentioned, Gog, Meshach, and Tubal. So from what we have briefly seen, a very large army will come to Israel who will pillage and destroy everything as it goes. Israel will not be able to do anything. They won't be able to defend themselves. Half the city will go into captive. Millions shall be slain on the hills and the mountains. And it's then that Christ will return and fight for Israel. And it's then that the nations that rejected God shall submit to his reign or shall be overcome. For from that day, the setting up of God's kingdom on earth shall commence. When Jesus will reign in true righteousness, he will be the perfect king in all judgments in all his ways. And it's only then that we shall have finally peace on the earth. Now we've spoken a lot about what happens in that day, or in those days as the Bible describes it, but um, there's several other different phrases, I suppose, which is synonymous to in that day, such as in those days, or even it shall, it shall come to pass. But all these references are talking about the time when Jesus shall return to the earth, and when those who have died in Christ shall be raised from the dead, those who are responsible to be judged, and those found worthy and becoming saints of the kingdom of God shall appear with him in the, to the rest of the earth to set up God's kingdom on earth. It's the time when Israel, who is, um, is that time when the God of Israel, who is the God of the Bible, shall be acknowledged as the only true God. To give you an example, um, Matthew 24, verse 29 to 31, if you want to turn up, or it was actually in our reading, um, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. First section, verse 29, it's a symbolic. So uh, the sun, moon, and stars have been symbols of the powers, political powers. Obviously, they're being shaken, so they're in turmoil, having no solution, no way out. A sign of Christ's return. Verse 31, the elect, those who know God and are considered responsible to be judged for their actions, these people should be brought together to meet their Savior. This is before... They reveal themselves to the world in Zechariah 14. But a logical question to follow would be, well, when will these last signs be? We have we're not exactly given a time. No man knoweth the day nor the hour. If you look down in our reading in Matthew 24, verse 36, it says quite clearly there that no man knoweth the day nor the hour. No, not even the angels of the heaven, but the Father only. But what we do know is what the world will be like around the times of the end, around these last times. And so when we talk about in that day, what does it mean? Well, we, we've seen that it's the time of the end when Christ will return. And, but now we know what the world will be like, so what will the world be like? 2 Peter 3, verse 3 to 4, says that knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, 
Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, that's what people today is. It's becoming a continually anti-Christian society. And so people are going, well, it's apparently Christ is going to return. And that's a sign. That's a sign that Christ will return. That more and more people are rejecting him in his ways. And it's a confidence for those who will see that the Lord will return. Luke 21, which is the um, same part of scripture, but recorded by Luke as to Matthew in Matthew 24. And it says in verse 25 to 26, that there should be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations, what we're saying is symbolic of the political powers being shaken. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. See, people only believe that the return of Christ is a myth, and that there's a story made up. But as we know, that's prophecy. We have confidence that the prophecy which has occurred and come to pass has come to pass exactly as he said. So therefore, anything which will come to pass, we have confidence that God's will will happen. And so distress will happen on the earth. No way of knowing where to go out. Men's and women's hearts failing them for fear. When they look at the world around them, and they honestly look at it and go, where is this world coming to? You hear that, people at work, at uni, or wherever. You only have to look at today's news to know that the description in Luke 21 fits the age in which we live today. You just have to think about coronavirus, how it's brought job insecurity, financial insecurity, potentially even a financial crisis, health fears, social distancing and isolation, which in itself has brought mental health problems, even uh, increase in domestic violence. It's, it's not a pretty list at all. It's horrendous. And whilst we don't have enough time to consider all the events that lead up to Christ's return, many of which, which are covered, thankfully, through um, the lectures from this platform from, months to m from week to week. But the only conclusion we can come to is that we are living in these last days. We're living in the times of Christ's return. I mean, the re return of the Jews to the land, the presence of the King of the North on the borders of, Jerusalem, of Israel, sorry, the problems, disasters, natural disasters, crises that shake our world today was prophesied and told 2,000 years ago. All these show that Christ's return is getting nearer and nearer, just in case you don't realize or, or even appreciate how significant this is. I just want to spend five minutes talking about the nation of Israel, God's people, and their miraculous return to the land, which will be covered more next week. So the sign of Israel. The first thing to understand is that Israel are God's chosen people. Deuteronomy 7 um, verse 6 says, For thou, talking to Israel, art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. For the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. It goes on to say in that passage how that it wasn't, they weren't chosen because they're the biggest and mighty nation or even the wisest because they're actually the smallest and feeblest, apparently, in that time. But it was, they're chosen because God loved them. And they made promises unto Abraham their father, which we won't go into tonight. But that's another topic which you can hear from this platform. But you only have to read your history books to see that the Babylonians, they came and went. So did the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks came, they went, the Romans after them. And you can't walk down the street today and go, oh yeah, that person's from Babylonian descent, or even, oh, that guy's a Roman. But you can do that to the Jew. The Jews survived horrendous, monstrous things done to them. From being blamed for the Black Death, being burnt at the stake for that, or even to the genocide in the gas chambers of World War II. God brought them through that to the nation they are today, a nation in place for the coming of Christ. You see the angels working around, as our, our presider said in this chair, in his prayer this morning, um, before. How it's like God working on a, on a board, moving the nations, bringing things come to pass, so that in that time when Christ is 
to return, that day which God only knows. Everything is in position, even the nation of Israel in the land today. Next point. Well, if Israel is in the land, what will Israel look like in, these last, in the last days? Ezekiel 28, verse 25 to 26 says, Thus saith the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, and they shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, and then shall they dwell in their land, and their land that I have given to my servant Jacob, the land which was given to them ah, four and a half thousand years ago, is the same land they're in today, even though they didn't possess it for two thousand years. But in that land they shall dwell safely therein, and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Firstly, they're back in the land as we've already shown. The same land they had for over 2,000, over 2000 years ago. But they shall live in safety. Something which they have not done for 2,000 years. They shall live in Sealed houses with a high agricultural gain and confidence. This was prophesied nearly two and a half thousand years ago in Ezekiel 28. So this is what the Bible says they should be like. Well, let's have a look at Israel today. In terms of agriculture, they're 74th out of 196 countries in the world for agricultural value. So that's 74th out of 196. But bear in mind that they are 373 times smaller than Australia. So that's only 0.27% of the land mass as of Australia. And in, Australia is only 20th in the world, if you put that in perspective. That's punching far above their weight. And what about military dominance? You might have heard of the Iron Dome. It's essentially an anti-missile defense system that intercepts any short-range rock, rockets and artillery at a 90% effectiveness. This combined with several other factors, and depending which website and comparison you look at, makes them the eighth most powerful nation in the world. You see the point I'm trying to make here. Israel is cruising along, is punching way above its weight for the size and its population. But this can be expected because, as we see, Ezekiel 28, that's what God said would happen. That will draw confidently, plant vineyards, agriculture. But lastly, I want to go to the point that was made in our, read in our reading, actually. And so in Matthew 24, verse 32 to 35, the parable of the fig tree, uh, just a, I know. Um, here, the fig tree represents Israel. So if we were to read Matthew 30, 24, verse 32 to 35, it says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, learn a parable of Israel. When its branch is yet tender and put it forth her leaves, when it becomes a nation and is... Um, starting to develop, you know that summer is nigh. Summer being the return of Christ. We see that, yes. So likewise, ye, when you see these th things come to pass and know that it is near, even at the doors. They've been in the land since 1948. I'd say it's, they're definitely putting forth their leaves. And it goes on to say that, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till they, these things be fulfilled. Generation that saw... Nation, uh, nation of Israel becoming a nation in 1948, they will not pass until Christ returns. He says as an uh, affirmation, heaven and earth shall not pass away, shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That's how sure we can be in God's word. And so we come to the coming of Christ. The day of the Lord. 6,000 years of human history, and finally we come to the start of God's plan of setting his kingdom up on earth. But how do these events unfold, which is our topic? After Russia, what happens next? Well, Jesus Christ arrives to the world in Zechariah 14, verse 3 to 5, which is going on from what we have read previously. It says that then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as in the day as he fought in the day of battle, he will destroy Gog 
Russia and all its confederations. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half the mountain shall be moved to the north, and half it shall be moved to the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, going to the end there, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So as you can see, God, um, Christ and the uh, saints will go forth to battle against the nations. And there'll be an earthquake. The earthquake which will part the Mount of Olives. Now this prophecy was made um, oh, two and a half thousand years ago, roughly. But you won't be surprised to know that fault lines were only discovered in the late 1800s. That's 200 years ago. This discovery only makes the prophecy in Zechariah, it makes it more certain that the future will come because back then they didn't know about fault lines and all that, but there's a prophesied an earthquake. And it's because, an, uh, oh, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, I might just get a pointer, but a fault line goes right under the Mount of Olives, making it um, more certain that this prophecy will come true just left of the Palmyra fold belt, if I've said that correctly. A couple of other things to mention, which we won't turn up to. Ezekiel 39, the chapter after Ezekiel 38, there's the use of, of nature, fire and brimstone to fight against the nations in war. Additionally, Matthew 24, our reading, again echoes that um, says that the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. As finally, Christ returned to the earth, which is our hope and our desire. But now I want to focus on well, Christ's return. What, what happens after that? Well, I've got several things on the slide there. I won't focus on them all, turn them all up. You can jot them down, jot the references, and you can check, check them out. But Sorry about this. Um, it should, so, what happens next? A couple of points. I won't look at it all, but the one I want to focus on is the re-education of the people. Isaiah 2, verse 2 to 4. Because, as we know, we're in a predominantly non-Christian society. And when Christ returns, they will know that there is the one true God. And so, there needs to be a re-education of the people. So, if we turn up Isaiah 2, it says that it shall come to pass in the last days. There's our phrase again that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains in Zion through that earthquake. Zion will be exalted. They will be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Here we go. And many people shall say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. People will want to go to learn. People will want to go and worship the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And they shall judge among the nations. They shall rebuke many people. Those which don't want to comply to, to Christ's law and kingdom. But notice the next part. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. There'll be no, no more conflicts, no more arguments, no more reason to go to war because we have the one true king who dwells in Jerusalem and he will reign in righteousness because all people will acknowledge that Christ's ways are the right ways. No question about it. And so there'll be no conflict, no need for war because war will be a thing of the past. Here's a, more, a few more things. The restoration of the earth to Eden-like state. The continual worship and praise of God. Death, sorrow, pain and suffering will be done away with. And God will be all in all. Now, I want to go through Isaiah 35. and You can either close your eyes or not if you want, but I want you to imagine what it will be like. Because this is the future on earth. And so as I read Isaiah 35, just imagine and picture, picture yourself there. Isaiah 35, the 
wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall bloom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands, confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in the heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall be a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons which lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, a way, and be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the law shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is our hope. This is why we want our Lord Jesus Christ to return. It's the hope we have of a glorious, perfect kingdom in which world peace will be achieved because God dwells righteously. And if God dwells righteously, then true peace will come. But what's the point in all the change to the earth, you might ask? What's the reason behind all this? Well, surely the aim of the kingdom is to, is to restore the world as God intended it. The verse on the screen says, But truly, as I live... All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. You see, the world at the moment, it's, it's, it's run by human nature. Human nature which is selfish, self-centered, greedy. It's, it's a completely different way to what God wants. But God who is merciful, long-suffering, kind, gentle, patient. He is the God of love. That's the world I want to live in. And so the aim of the kingdom is to fill the earth with his glory. The glory being the characteristics of God being shown in men and women like you and I walking through this earth, giving glory to him. That's the hope which we look for. So that leaves us with one last thing. How can you and how can I be there with Christ, the future perfect king of the earth? It's actually very simple. It's, it's easy. Everyone, everyone can do it. Baptism. It's a simple matter of if you believe and want to be part of it or not. The verse on the screen, Mark 16, verse 16, says, He that believeth and that he that is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. So as we have seen tonight, Russia is right on the borders of Israel. Prophecies found in the Bible have already come to pass. And the very few future prophecies left are happening in the world today. Russia will come and will nearly destroy Israel, which will bring Jesus' return. That return which will set up God's kingdom perfect kingdom righteously bringing world peace time is extremely short we've seen that for those of us who believe and have gone through the waters of baptism hold on don't lose your faith for the time is short and surely lift up your heads for our redeemer is nigh and for those who are listening who 
haven't yet responded to the gospel message, but perhaps are interested in the future of eternal life in a perfect world. If you're interested, do something about it, because there's not much time left. Thank you.